This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is George Packer, who is a staff writer uh, for The New Yorker, and his book, The Unwinding, won the 2013 National Book Award. George, welcome back to Berkeley. Good to be back with you, Harry. So you've written quite a bit recently on technology and Silicon Valley. You grew up there. But it wasn't called that. Right. But you, were, you grew up there before it was Silicon Valley. It was the Santa Clara Valley, yes. And have, have things have really changed since you were completely, there. Completely, yeah. completely. You know, in a way, physically, it hasn't changed that much. You know, the, the layout of neighborhoods and the size of houses, there's some giant mansions that are tucked away in the Woodside Hills, but, you know, the zoning and just the, the way you present yourself mandates a bit against too much gaudy display. So it still looks like the place I grew up in for the most part, but it's not. It was, when I was there in the 60s and 70s, it was a middle class community. Everyone went to public school. Um, people didn't have, there weren't all that many poor people and there were very few rich people. It was, it was sort of a, the post-war middle class um, society in microcosm, and it was a good place, it was a really good place to grow up. And, and, and you, you point out in your recent article that property values, which we all know here, are, are quite something now in comparison. What could was a $100,000 home is now over $2 million. The average price in Palo Alto, I think, is well over $2 million now. Um, and these are pretty small houses, too. So, I mean, what happened at, pretty much right when I left, 1978, went off to college, the computer revolution began. I mean, Apple had just put out the Apple II the year before. Uh, there was, you know, there was technology when I was growing up. I used to ride my bike through Xerox Park and Varian and Hewlett Packard on my way to, to junior high and high school. But, you know, the juggernaut of Apple and of Silicon Graphics and of, you know, the startup uh, and, and tech boom of the 90s and then social media and all that's happened came after I left and it just produces incredible wealth, real income inequality of a kind that I didn't know when I was growing up. Um, and yeah, it's, it's now the center of, you know, it's the gold rush. It's where everyone, every kid at Harvard wants to go and make a fortune. Uh, as you as you did your reporting there, you a picture emerged for you of of the worldview of Silicon Valley. Uh, what what is what is that gestalt? Uh, we'll talk about politics in a minute, but but sort of what what what, what do you think uh, drives the place and 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 is reflected in in the way they think about the world? Yeah, I mean I, it's hard to generalize. Uh, I talked to maybe two dozen people in tech. Um, it's libertarian, but it's not all that doctrinaire, uh, except in a few cases. It's kind of a sense of, you know, we're doing something incredible here, and the government should leave us alone because it really doesn't understand what we're doing. And if we can just be allowed to thrive, the best ideas will win. It's a meritocracy. Uh, no one really cares who you are, where you come from, what your parents' name was. It's everyone kind of comes forward with the best uh, entrepreneurial idea and uh, and the best one wins or the best ones win and there's a lot of losers there's a lot of blood on the floor but there's also a lot of young guys and some young women who are you know have more money than they know what to do with um, and there's also this I guess this strain of idealism that dictates that, <clears throat> that they should be doing something good. 
And the phrase change the world became this mantra that I heard everywhere. And it came, passed people's lips a little too easily without their having really asked themselves what that meant and whether they were doing it. But they were talking about it. This product is going to change the world. This app is going to change the world. And that's inherently a good thing. Innovation is inherently good. Their favorite word, disruption, is inherently good. Um, so that it's hard for them to, you know, they're not like people in the oil and gas sector. They really need to believe that they are helping mankind, uh, whether or not they are. And, and in the book, uh, the, your book, The Unwinding, you focused on one uh, person, P uh, Peter Thiel from Silicon Valley. And he, in a way, embodies embodied a lot of what you're describing. Well, he's a real libertarian. Peter Thiel, uh, who founded PayPal and really made his fortune as the first investor in Facebook. Um, he, he's a, a conservative libertarian, you know, contributes to Ron Paul's presidential campaigns, et cetera. Uh, but he's also a bit of a skeptic about some of the loftier claims of Silicon Valley. He, you know, when I was with him talking about tech, he, and he was sort of my guide to, <clears throat> to that world for a while, he would say things like, you know, the internet is a net plus, but not a big one. Or he'd pull out his, his iPhone and say, I don't consider this to be a technological breakthrough. He actually looked around and saw that the standard of living in America had not markedly increased mm -hmm. because of the information revolution, which is something that that's news that not that many people in Silicon Valley have received. And he concluded that maybe it was a bit oversold. It hadn't done what the airplane and the automobile and earlier technological innovations had done, which is to raise living standards across the board. Instead, it's made some people quite rich, fabulously rich. It's also killed a lot of jobs and it hasn't created nearly enough to pick up the slack and has become sort of a lifestyle and a, um, a worldview without really being able to claim that it has um, transform the economy. That's so. He's he's a bit of a critic. But, but and how do you account for the difference of his mentality? I mean, he has a, a future orientation. He's yeah. working on computation and biology and 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 really AI, looking into the future. intelligence and, and critical and, of institutions. And yeah. he, he has these these awards that he gives out to to young people that that are outside the educational system. Yeah. So so what explains the the difference? Is it maturity? I think he's a little older than um, the new generation of social media princes and princesses. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's a contrarian. Mm -hmm. He had to be a contrarian to survive at Stanford during the late 80s when he edited the Stanford Review, which was this very provocative right-wing student paper that was making a lot of trouble. I mean, they were really going after, you know, the the multicultural ethos, the PC and diversity police, as he would see it. That he courted controversy, and <clears throat> I think it's sort of instinctive for him. He likes to argue, and now he's surrounded by, um, you know, young people, some of whom he really admires and has invested money in their projects, especially. Things like, as you say, that seem really radical and designed to transform uh, life. Life extension is a big interest of his. He thinks that death is an ideology, not a, not a fact. And as he put it, an ideology that has killed billions of human beings. So he's, you know, and he also studied philosophy at Stanford. He was a he was heavily influenced by the French philosopher Rene Girard a kind of Catholic conservative. Um, I think he, he just has maybe more going on politically, intellectually, philosophically than most of the young people who have completely subsumed themselves in the world of the tech startup and aren't really reading or thinking about very many other things. And, and you, you uh, say it, it's an engineering mentality that that is that sort of helps us understand the way these young people, uh, uh, the, the, the dominant figures, is, is, that, is that fair? Fair. That's something that Ben Horowitz um, of Berkeley and uh, of 
Andreessen Horowitz um, venture capital said to me, he said, you know, the prevailing mindset is an engineering mindset which wants things to be elegant and perfect and complete. So it's looking for a system in which there's no bugs. And one of them used to be Marxism, which his father, um, David Horowitz, once subscribed to. And another is libertarianism. And he was a little dismissive. He was dismissive of both of those, although certainly between the two, Ben Horowitz is more libertarian than Marxist. So he got me thinking about the way in which it, being an engineer and not really having much interest in the gray areas and in nuances and in the things that complicate a picture, rather wanting a kind of elegant simplicity, how that might affect the, the political I ideas that people in Silicon Valley hold. Now, as the, the, the wealthy in Silicon Valley have come to understand the, the implications of their wealth, they're, they're changing their view of politics and what they can do, and, and it's gradually evolving. In the beginning, politics and, and government could be dismissed because it incompetent. Right, right. There was, a, I think, a contempt for the slow, plodding, bureaucratic nature of government. Just don't regulate us. Stay out of our way. You have no idea what you're doing. You don't know. You don't understand what we do. All you can do is screw up these beautiful things that we make. Um, I think Silicon Valley has gotten so big, so powerful. Companies like Google and Apple and Oracle are just—they can't ignore. Um, they can't ignore Washington. And in fact, they've had lobbyists there for a long time, but. The evolution that's happened more recently is they've gone from being dominated by tech figures who simply saw Washington as a place to pursue a rather narrow version of their own interests, like, you know, uh, offshore taxation, repatriation of offshore profits and what, what the tax rate on that should be. Mark Zuckerberg has tried to move the tech community away from what to outsiders would seem like a sort of selfish idea of their own, you know, of politics, to more like a, a sense that tech needs to take some larger responsibility for the problems that beset the country. And he made his first project immigration reform. And that was happening last year around this time in, in April when I was out here reporting this piece that you mentioned. So I talked to people. Not Zuckerberg himself, he wouldn't talk to me, but people around him who had founded this, uh, this political advocacy group called Forward.us that was really just a, 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 a group designed to put pressure on and make it easier for people in Congress to support immigration reform with the idea that that would benefit not just the tech world, but the whole economy, the whole country. And, and as they, they get involved, there, there's often a, a kind of a lack of self-consciousness of the way uh, what they see as the greater good is really very much tied to their own interests. So in immigration, they were pushing for the, the H-1 visas for highly uh, trained and educated technical people to come to Silicon Valley and work. That had always been Silicon Valley's focus on immigration. I think what Zuckerberg wanted to do, and I admire him for this is to broaden it to what do you do with all the illegal uh, immigrants in this country? What do you do with their children? Apparently Zuckerberg um, tutored or guest taught a class in, I think in East Palo Alto, um, in which one of his students got up and said, I'm not sure I'm going to get to go to college because my parents brought me here illegally from Mexico when I was little. And that changed his thinking and woke him up and led directly to forward.us. And so I, I guess they want comprehensive reform. And if, if H-1 visas and more foreign-born engineers are part of it, then so much the better for Silicon Valley. Do, do, do you get the sense that they are not, they continue to be naive as they get involved, that they, they've been supporting some campaigns, I guess Lindsey Graham and, and some of the, the, the ads have been kind of off the wall that they put money into, or well, is that just an unintended consequence? Their, their MO was anything but innovative. 
it, it was not a Silicon Valley-like uh, political campaign. They just made some TV ads on behalf of Republican congressmen and senators, because they're the ones who uh, are the hardest sell on immigration reform. And they were hostile to, you know, the Affordable Care Act and very pro-Keystone Pipeline and just ruffled a lot of feathers in Silicon Valley among liberals who didn't want to see the pooled money of the tech community, which was going into this advocacy group, being used to, you know, advance causes that a lot of people in Silicon Valley hated uh, and some candidates that they hated. Maybe you could say this is just real politic. You have to do this. You have to find a way to support uh, conservatives because they're the votes you need. But it seemed clumsy. Um, I think in general they are naive in the sense that they still cannot quite accept that they are simply the latest version of corporate giantism. They are often regarded and seem to regard themselves as something closer to public utilities that are there for the benefit of everyone. Amazon is that way. Facebook is that way. Google is that way. Um, and when you poke at them a little, they get rather defensive, and they're actually more thin-skinned than you would think people with that much wealth, power, success, uh, influence would be. But yeah, I think th there's a bit of a, I think my piece was part of what we can now see as a kind of backlash against, um, not against tech itself, but against its ethos and its way of presenting itself. Because on all sorts of issues, whether it's privacy or trade or competitive, you know, monopoly um, or, or income inequality, it has pushed people in directions that they might, might not want to go. And there's been, I think, a bit of a mutiny against that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's going to continue because they are the standard oil, the U.S. steel um, of, of our day. You, you point out that, that they seem to lack an understanding that politics involves conflict, that, that people want different things, and it's a, it's a conflict over values. There is a, a, an attitude toward government that I saw among some of them, and also among one of their biggest boosters, Gavin Newsom, lieutenant governor, um, that really the answers to our civic problems are more engineering answers than they are political answers. What we need are, is to see these problems as um, almost like a, a, an equation that needs to be worked out or a, a piece of software that needs to be you know, rid of bugs. And once you can do that, and just if people would stop being so ideological and simply recognize the pragmatic benefits of doing things in a more tech-friendly way, We'll solve a lot of problems, you know, and on some issues, I think that's true, especially like local issues and more more small scale and practical issues. But politics is about the conflict of competing interests and the, how do you work them out? How do you resolve them um, without going to war? S and in that sense, it, it looks nothing like a computer program. It looks more like politics. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't get the feeling that that's that that's alien to a lot of uh, a lot of people who are who want to use technology to improve uh, the way we're governed. There, there there are some bright spots in their thinking in the sense that the, the notion that uh, government could be a platform where decentralized groups of citizens can, can communicate with each other and solve problems. Right. So, so it's, it's anti-hierarchical, as you said, and, 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 and there's some virtue in that. Yeah, and, and you know, the idea that you can bring people into civic life more if you have you know, town, online town hall meetings instead of forcing them to come out on a rainy night and show up at a, a forum with their local officials. Um, if you can, you know, get bright young people to develop apps that will, you know, solve problems like um, potholes or like 
reserving park benches, things like this. I don't, there's nothing wrong with it. It's good, yes. It's limited, it's limited. And I, I think anyone who imagines that peer networking and government as a platform is, you know, these become buzzwords that, you know, kind of disintegrate once they reach, once they run up against hard issues. And politics is about hard things. It's about issues that aren't easily resolved because people have competing ideas and competing interests. And once you get to that level, I don't think there's a whole lot that an app is going to do for you. Uh, you wrote a piece, long piece, recently on Amazon. It's really the autopsy of a major uh, tech company. Except and they're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right. It's, it's, more, it's a, yeah, more like an MRI. Bad, bad <laughs> word, uh, with a writer, yeah. Uh, so so let, let's talk a little about that because uh, the bottom line is you're really uh, saying that the technology is might be killing the publishing industry as we know it. Not so much the technology, but Amazon's way of doing business. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, in my family, we use Amazon a lot, and that's because they are so good at what they do. They have made, you know, the three things you look for in shopping, selection, price, and convenience, they've made them so easy that it's very hard to justify getting in your car or going out in the snow and going and buying it at a shop. So I think they're a huge success. And Jeff Bezos, is a, he's, he's got a real streak of genius. To have seen back in 94 that book selling was not just something you could do online, but the way to do everything else. He understood that books were this unique product because there's so many different kinds. There, you know, there's not that many different kinds of shampoo, maybe 50, maybe even 100. There are millions of different books. And that gives online selling a giant advantage over a bricks and mortar bookstore. He, then collect the data on the people who come to your site to buy the books and use it to learn how to sell them other things and eventually to sell them everything. I mean, I think he saw all of that at the beginning, 20 years ago. It's remarkable. But what I learned in the reporting of that piece is that Amazon um, has become a threat, a, a fairly dire threat to its very suppliers, which happened with Walmart, too. When you've got this giant retailer pushing prices down to a point where suppliers can no longer really stay in business and meet it, um, then Amazon looks sort of like Walmart pushing manufacturing into China in order to be able to meet Walmart's price demands. Well, in, you can't push book publishing into China. Amazon is taking it over itself. Amazon has become a huge publisher um, of ebooks and even tried to get into the print book game. Didn't do very well at it because um, it actually requires things that Amazon is not at all good at, like patience and discernment and going on editorial instinct rather than on data. Um, but it is changing the entire structure of the book publishing business. Um, squeezing publishers for more and more of a discount, up to 60% now, which was news to a lot of people, even in the publishing business when I reported that, um, so that there's less and less left for what we would think of as what is mostly, publishing is mostly about. Editing, designing, production, marketing, the author, um, the profit, overhead, everything is like 25% of the cost of a book, of the price of a book. Amazon takes 60%. So it's making it harder for publishers to, go, to, to keep the old model of paying an author in advance so that he or she can spend several years working on a hard, risky, challenging project, which is near to my heart. I mean, that to me is why else do it if you're not doing something like that? Instead, Amazon is turning authors into um, partners, business partners with Amazon. Put it out there on Kindle through the, either the Kindle self-publishing platform or another of Amazon's many 
um, digital platforms. And, and you get a 70% royalty and Amazon takes 30%. But what's missing is, you know, editing, <laughs> um, is the care of the publishing house that has thought about why they're gonna publish this book and how they're gonna publish this book. Um, and the long-term relationship an author needs with an editor. So it's called disintermediation in business jargon, and I think it's not good for good books. It's good for books as just a mass commodity, like nails. Yes, it's gonna make, it's, readers are gonna be delighted to pay 99 cents for a book, but can you really go on writing and publishing good books if they're worth 99 cents you know that's what i came to and and you you point out uh, and, and you talked about it, this idea of gathering the data was the end that he had from the beginning and and then in turn monetizing the data yeah. so that the publishing is a means to an end uh, as opposed to being the the end itself which i guess is what traditional publishing is. I think Amazon and Jeff Bezos were really not all that interested in books as books. They were interested in books as commodities. And, you know, they've done a lot for the book business. They've done a lot for writers. I mean, they've sold fabulous numbers of books for me and uh, lots of other people. But it wasn't out of a keen interest in publishing. And one publisher said to me, you know, Yes, they're a major threat to us. Yes, uh, they squeeze us all the time. But, you know, they tried to do traditional publishing in New York. It failed. They moved on. We're still here because we care and they don't. This is what we care about. They care about other things. And, and what is the implications of this for the culture and for journalism also because Bezos has now bought the Washington Post. We don't have a sense yet of, of what he will do, but, but it, it has devastating consequences, doesn't it, for the culture? Well, that's happened. I mean, that horse has left the barn. Yeah. We, we have seen, you know, not just because of um, internet companies, but partly technology companies, you know, we've seen the newspaper industry just collapse. I mean, I think the purchase of the post is a bit different. I think in that case, Bezos is doing something intellectually challenging for him, uh, something that's gonna make him much more of a public figure, and that's almost a civic act. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post is not really gonna be, it's his own, it's not Amazon's, and it's not really close to Amazon's core business. So actually, if I were at the Post, I'd feel glad that we're not a, a real Amazon product. We're be now Bezos' newspaper, and I don't think he's going to let it, uh, he's not going to strip it the way someone like Sam Zell, who was a private equity titan, stripped the, the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune. I think the Post is, is probably fortunate to have Bezos owning it because he has money, which the Post was losing, and he's already invested a fair amount of money in the right things, reporting um, and, and other things. So that's separate, I think, from, it's more like his, his interest in space exploration. But Amazon as a giant worldwide retailer with lots of other things going on too, like Amazon Web Services and Amazon Studios and Amazon Publishing, yeah, there I do see a threat, a cultural threat, because they are all about, you know, democratizing everything, getting rid of the gatekeepers. Well, who are the gatekeepers? Independent bookstore owners, librarians, um, the Sunday review supplement in your newspaper, publishers. I think those are actually rather important institutions and, and figures in continuing to cultivate uh, a public for serious books. Amazon throws millions of titles out there. And if you can't get your book published by Random House, you can get it published by Amazon. But honestly, you know, I care less about that than I do about the, the viability, the, the economic viability of good books 
with publishers who care about them. And that's what Amazon, I think, threatens. And, and you're, you, you suggest that it's really increasing the inequality, basically. It, 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 it's similar to what's going on in the rest of society, that you're going to have a few authors doing very well and then authors at the bottom, but, but you, you, you're using that uh, middle rank authors who, who actually are emerging talent. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is not entirely because of Amazon. This has been happening in publishing for a long time. The publishers bear a lot of blame for their own dire circumstances. I mean, they chase after follies, blockbusters, or you know, the latest fad that's just not going to, either is not gonna earn out that title or is not, doesn't have a future. Um, and that partly came because they themselves were consolidating into these big publishing conglomerates. There's now only five, really five publishing houses in New York, and they're owned by European concerns. So publishing has become a trust. Um, and, and the chains also put a lot of pressure on this and created this blockbuster mentality. So what I heard from editors and agents in New York was it's becoming more like the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. More and more of the publisher's money and effort goes into fewer and fewer titles. And they're the more predictable titles. They're the brand names. Um, meanwhile, at the bottom, there's a mass of unedited stuff being published on, you know, in ebook form, which is cheap. The midlist author, which is what publishers have always called, like the one who's not gonna sell a whole lot, but has staying power and worth and you know, we should take a little loss here because we're gonna invest in their career. That writer is having a harder and harder time getting work published. Uh, you also have written recently about the, the implications, well, in, in The Unwinding, you talk about the implications of globalization for the worker. And, and now, I, you, recently, you've, you've talked a little about what technology is doing to the worker. The, in, in the case of Amazon, uh, that comes up and so on. Talk a little about that, because is it just the eliminating of the jobs uh, and uh, that, that we're seeing because of the technology? Well, one figure that I saw um, while I was doing the piece was that Yes, Amazon creates jobs. Amazon has a large workforce. Like at peak, it's seasonal, but at peak, including in the warehouses, it's about 120,000 or something like that. But, um, it, and I'm not gonna be able to give you the exact figure, for every job that Amazon creates, a bricks and mortar store would create more jobs. So if Amazon is partly responsible for the, the end of some of the, stores that you used to go to uh, on Main Street, that is actually a net loss of jobs, even though Amazon is creating more. But it's also the kind of jobs Amazon is creating. It seems like the perfect new economy company in that it's either engineers with advanced degrees uh, or MBAs, or it's $11, $10 an hour warehouse workers. Um, it's, uh, it's an economy of extremes. And the warehouse is a pretty awful place to work from what, you know, investigative reporters have found out. But the other thing about Amazon that struck me maybe after I finished the piece was how little people know about it, how invisible it is. It's, what is Amazon? It's a website with a buy button that you click and two days later, a cardboard box with a smile on it that arrives at your house. And one day, it might not even be a guy in a brown UPS uniform. It may be a, a drone, drone <laughs> if Bezos wasn't just snookering Charlie Rose on 60 Minutes. Um, so there's a way in which Amazon has eliminated the human factor from shopping. And with that, some of our awareness of the cost of uh, low prices and, uh, and online retailing when you go into Walmart, you are just you're you just are sort of aware instinctively that there's some injustice here. These people who have to come up and say, "How are you, sir? Can I help you?" with a smile on their face, you know how much they're getting paid. You know the stories of, you know, they're not getting benefits. They may be getting cheated out of overtime. You know, um, and and so you're just you you can't help. You know, you see the. The girl at the cash register has a splint on her hand because of, you know, 
uh, repetitive motion problems and you wonder how much are they really paying her? Does she have health insurance? With Amazon, you don't have to think about that. So it's almost, uh, it lets you off the hook. We're all you know, seduced by its ease, but also by sort of its invisibility. It's like something more magical. Uh, I think the internet is a, has had that effect. It's made us forget about workers and about what may be happening to them in the internet economy. And, and how is that reflected in the culture? I mean, we don't, we don't see in the culture the the worker represented in the in the trials and tribulation or the or the change in the, the status they as you say they're they're sort of invisible and this is very different from the way it was in in the depression era yeah i think you know the the worker the, there was a, a, a an image of the worker and it was not necessarily a happy image it was of someone in a factory or a coal mine dirty hot um oppressed in some ways, but also at the center of things. Like this, you know, either a threat if you're on the side of the owners or a victim, or maybe the heroic future of mankind if you are of that persuasion, but the, in the center, part of, um, part of our, our picture of ourselves as a society. And now workers are just, you know, low wage workers are so disposable, so interchangeable, they have no voice. Um, they can't, you know, they, they can't dictate their hours even because most of them work part time or a lot of them do. So their employer tells them you're not coming in tomorrow. You're coming in Thursday night. Uh, I don't care what you have going on that night. They, they are really um, disposable. In the unwinding, there's a family called the Hartzels in Tampa, Florida, who are the poorest people in the book. And, uh, and he worked for both Target and Walmart. And just hearing about his job and seeing him at Walmart, I went in to visit him, just brought home to me how he felt, you know, just sort of expendable. And there's no, there's neither heroism nor a sense of they're part of a, a social movement that's rising. I mean, there is a minimum wage movement in this country and there's a low wage worker movement, but unions aren't really able to speak for them. It's very hard to organize them. Amazon says we don't want unions because they are going to hurt the customer experience and everything is about the customer experience. So, uh, yeah. The, so it's the, consu it's the, the consumer now. It's yeah. not the worker. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the, probably the, the weak point for Amazon is if consumers begin to feel there's something wrong about shopping on Amazon. The way people began to feel there was something wrong about Walmart coming into your community in the mall up the road and killing off the local pharmacy and the local bookstore and the local, you know, grocer and, um, and began to boycott it or began to say, you're not going to build that store here. It's harder with Amazon because it's invisible. There is no store here. But um, for people, for example, who care about books, I do think there's an, a rising consciousness that Amazon might not be the best thing for books. People, I've been to a lot of independent bookstores lately with the unwinding, and there's a kind of militant independent bookstore consciousness <laughs> that has set in for those that have survived, because a lot of them, including here in Berkeley, have not survived. Uh, you, you argue uh, in one of your pieces that uh, another problem for the worker is that there's really no vision out there, no political vision, and you know, in the past it was Marxism or there was the New Deal, and and now there there is really no sort of organizing vision of what the future might be like uh, that would require action on on their part. Yeah, I think the vision that you can see is the opposite of solidarity, which is in the title of a book. Um, published by Silicon Valley executive, the startup of you. Everyone is their own company. Everyone is an entrepreneur. You have to keep remaking yourself, learning new things, being retrained, um, risking everything without a net. There's, you know, that, that is a compelling picture of what the economy is more and more like, and a lot of people buy into it. But there are a lot of Americans who don't want to be a startup. They want a job. They don't want to have to devote their entire life to that job. They want that job to support them and their family. And 
I mean, it's not news, but there aren't very many jobs that allow people without high skills, high education to do that. And even a college education isn't really a guarantee that you'll be able to do that. So education alone is not sufficient. There isn't a competing, inspiring picture of what the future of workers might be. There, the, there are little boomlets, little movements like minimum wage, which is happening state by state, community by community, and President Obama is trying to bring it to Congress. It won't happen. Um, but it doesn't seem to have a mass appeal. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't had the effect that the labor movement had in, you know, at, at its height in the 30s and 40s or that the civil rights movement had. I mean, I think it is the great social justice issue of our time is the fact that you can work full time and be impoverished. I think that that's, you know, there's something profoundly wrong there, but it just hasn't caught on as a national cause. Why uh, do you think uh, the institutions of our government, and here I include the Obama presidency, did not uh, do all that it might have done when it came into office uh, after the crash. Is it a matter of timing? Is it a matter of his political style? Or is it a matter of what you describe in the unwinding, the, the collapse of institutions of, as we've known them? I think it's all of that. I mean, I think the timing was bad in the sense that the recession um, really hit its rock bottom in the months right after Obama became president. And the White House made the mistake of continually forecasting its end and claiming that better times were coming when they weren't. And that, you know, left people um, skeptical. I was just actually in Washington last week at a hearing and I heard Senator Orrin Hatch refer to the 2009 recession, which was quite a, a, a trick of words because, of course, the recession really began in 2007. Um, and it was certainly a recession that was, you know, on George Bush's watch. Obama inherited it and watched it implode and could have done more. He, he, he you know, others have pointed out he could have forced Wall Street to its knees, possibly nationalized one or more of the big banks. Um, and s turned his Justice Department loose to prosecute executives and instead keep the financial markets stable. Let's bring them back to health. That was Timothy Geithner's uh, philosophy. That was Obama's. He's not, he's not confrontational. He's not going to go up against um, the establishment in the, you know, to that degree. And other things, the, the stimulus, which was, I think, necessary and okay, could have been a lot better. They were allergic to the idea of public works. So that at a time when I think even conservative communities would have said, please just create some jobs here. I, I've been in parts of Virginia, North Carolina, where like local bankers said, why didn't he just put people to work rehabilitating the post office? It hasn't had a makeover since the 30s. That kind of really aggressive government intervention. I think the Obama team just saw that as being like the old way. That's the, that was maybe the New Deal way. We're about the private sector. We're gonna bring the private sector back. Well, it's never been enough. They have never used government robustly enough to bring back demand. I mean, that's been Paul Krugman's argument for years and it, it just seems irrefutable. They just have never primed it, pushed it hard enough to get over the hump, so. And, and is it, do you think it's a matter of the president's style and the people he appointed in, in uh, to positions of it? Yeah. I yeah, I think Larry Summers and Christina Romer, and she's here now, I think, right? right? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I interviewed her once and I couldn't quite get her to say what she apparently did say um, to some others privately, which, which has been quoted saying, you know, we need a much bigger stimulus. And Larry Summers said, and, and Rahm Emanuel said, you can't get it passed. They were very realistic about it. 
but maybe they had more clout than they knew. But this gets to the other problem you cited. The institutional levers are not there. Obama reaches for one and pulls on it, and there's nothing on the other end. Congress can't be made to act like <laughs> um, a responsible legislative body. I mean, Mitch McConnell said, we're just going to make sure that all of this fails. It's going to be his recession. That, you know, given how much Republican policy was to blame, that was beyond irresponsible. It was just immoral. But that was the Republican strategy, and it's actually worked pretty well. So we no longer have, you know, a political class that's capable of responding to the exhortations of a Barack Obama, if, even if he had that, you know, rhetorical power, which he didn't have. Something happened to him after he became president. He lost the uh, ability to move people to, and to tell a story. He told his own story very well during the campaign, but to tell the story of America during that calamity that he inherited when he became president, he just couldn't do it. And is that because of any experience or his background? I think or? it's his nature. I yeah. think his character is cool. It's detached. He's skeptical of big claims and romantic gestures and uh, ideology. He's, he's a little Kennedy-esque, you know, more than LBJ-esque. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as Kennedy's presidency, I think, was limited by the cool temperament of the president, I think Obama's has been as well. And you make a comparison somewhere between the Senate and the financial industry, and in, in both cases, the the culture of uh, the elites became one where they they weren't concerned about the greater good, really, and and they were into manipulating the rules. That's a big part of this. Yeah, that was a, a piece about the Senate I wrote back in 2010. I kind of went down there as a like an anthropologist, just to try to figure out what is this thing? Why doesn't it seem to be getting very much done? What are its unwritten rules? What are its the relationships like? And what I found was, you know, there's this giant book of precedents that the senators are supposed to go by and that you can use to pretty much stop anything you want, any individual senator can do. Plus, there's the rules of the Senate, including the filibuster. Um, which was not in the Constitution, it was a Senate rule. Uh, those all had some, you know, you could understand where they came from, but they were, no, no one, you know, remembered the origins of them. They are now wholly destructive tools. They worked when senators had some self-restraint and had a sense of the higher purpose of the body and didn't want to destroy it and had a sense of national interest. Then those rules and precedents could be used to temper things and restrain. But now they're just nihilistic. They're just tools for destruction because that, that higher purpose is gone and s senators have this very short-term view of their own electoral fortunes and also of their party and of their ideology. And it's a, it's a really nihilistic place. I found it profoundly depressing to spend time in the Senate chamber where nothing happens. Uh, as I think it was Senator uh, Michael Bennett of Colorado said to me, you know, I sit there in the presiding officer's chair thinking, what are they doing in China right now while we're sitting here doing nothing? Um, and I compared it to Wall Street where the idea of, you know, markets that are freeing up cash for productive purposes in the economy seems to have yielded to very smart um, traders who are finding ways to create products that benefit nobody but themselves and that in the end could actually take down the economy. And it seemed a bit of the same thing going on in the Senate. One, one final question. As you uh, put your ear to these different landscapes, mixed metaphor there, but, but actually are, you know, traveling the country, looking into all these institutions, talking with people. Do you find a ray of hope somewhere you know, with uh, regard to where we are now? And, and where is that? You know, when I'm talking about these things, I actually begin to feel rather hopeless. Um, when I'm reading the paper, when I'm covering the Senate, 
when I'm even when I'm in Silicon Valley, which is sparkling with possibility and hope, but it all seems to me to be a little bit of, of a fizz rather than real ferment. Um, but when I actually get off the beaten track and do what reporters are supposed to do and find people who are not in the media limelight and find out how they're living and what are they thinking, and my book is full of people like that, um, it's really impossible to to be hopeless because they're still trying. In some ways, they're actually being very inventive and imaginative about how to remake their lives after losing a job or how to try to you know, improve things in their community by getting into alternative energy or things like this that they're not going to create, I don't think, a, you know, there's no simple solution, but the spirit is still there. You know, there's some people have lost their their will, I would say, but others like the ones like Tammy Thomas in my book, Dean Price, people like that, they're, you know, they're quite resilient. So that that's hopeful. And so I guess to be hopeful, don't read the news, go out and talk to people. And uh, uh, I think they should also go out and buy The Unwinding, which is now in paperback. That would because be great. Because it'll be a great motivator. So thank you, George, for taking the time for this bit of visit uh, to be here today. My pleasure, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.